The hearing of the Senate Energy and Natural Resources Subcommittee on Water and Power will come to order. I first want to apologize for being tardy, uh, trying to be in a few places at once. Thanks for your patience. Uh, throughout the West, water is central to everything we do. Uh, the infrastructure to provide and protect this water supply took centuries to build and has allowed our cities to grow and our farms to prosper. Without these dams and canals, recharge basins and reclaim water plants, the American West would not be the home breadbasket economic engine or worldwide destination that it is today. It's taken tremendous foresight and major investment to develop the water systems that are the backbone of our Western communities and businesses. And they've been great investments by any standard. In my home state in Arizona, what started as a $10 million federal investment in the Salt River Project in 1903 laid the groundwork for today's Phoenix metropolitan area, which now contributes $250 billion in GDP to the nation. Earlier this year, I toured all 15 counties in Arizona in my first 90 days as a senator. I saw firsthand how these major investments shaped the state. From Hoover Dam to Lake Powell, Salt River Project to the Central Arizona Project, Arizona's past and future relies entirely on how we deliver water. Federal investment in these projects is therefore critical. When I visited Yuma County in January, local water experts, including Wade Noble, one of our witnesses here today, laid out to me how the water districts responsibly maintain and manage Imperial Dam and related infrastructure, which supplies water to both California and Arizona's massive agricultural economy. Irrigation projects have unleashed Arizona's $23 billion agricultural economy. The return on these investments for our nation is clear. But it's now our turn to step up and make the next round of investments in our water infrastructure. We must ensure our existing facilities keep running and develop the next generation of projects that will provide water security for the next century. The bipartisan bills before us today will do just that. My bill, S-2044, the Water Supply, Infrastructure, Rehabilitation, and Utilization Act, which I'm proud to have worked side by side with Senator Sinema to develop, will make huge strides in addressing the significant needs at the Bureau of, existing Bureau of Reclamation assets. The beneficiaries of these assets, local irrigators and water districts, are responsible for covering the costs of regular operations and maintenance of the infrastructure. They do so by building these costs into rates that water users pay throughout the year. As with any large-scale infrastructure, infrastructure project, large capital upgrades are needed from time to time, and they are beyond regular operation and maintenance. We call this extraordinary maintenance, and it's often accompanied with a price tag too high to fold into a single year of rates. For example, Imperial Dam has upwards of $50 million in needed renovations. Yet because our water districts are just operators, not the actual owners of the federal infrastructure, they don't have access to many of the traditional financing tools needed to fund these critical repairs. This was something that Wade and uh, the team in Yuma brought to my attention right when I visited you there, and that has directly resulted in this legislation. So this is uh, representative government uh, in action. My bill addresses this by setting up an account within BOR to fund extraordinary maintenance projects and allows operators to repay the cost with interest over a longer period of time. Importantly, my bill modifies rec Reclamation's existing extraordinary maintenance authority to provide greater transparency and control to Congress and to stakeholders so that this authority is actually utilized as originally intended to get these types of repairs done. The bill also establishes a pilot program to modernize reservoir operations and increase water storage at existing dams without any new construction. When my bill looks at the needs of existing infrastructure, S-1932, the Drought, Resilience, and Water Supply Infrastructure Act, which I co-sponsored with Senator Gardner, Feinstein, and Cinema, focuses on the need for new infrastructure. Nearly every basin in the West will require new storage and supply to provide drought resilience in the face of population and economic growth, increasing environmental demands, and changing runoff regimes. But the needs and opportunities for developing new water resources are different for every community, and S-1932 recognizes that fact by creating a broad set of tools that allow water managers to keep all options on the table while developing their long-term strategy. We're in an exciting time and we have a real opportunity to move forward on water supply solutions that benefit water users and ecosystems. Instead of knee-jerk reactions and false choices between water development and the environment that have permeated the debate in past decades, water users and conservation groups are coming together to develop comprehensive solutions. I look forward to continuing this constructive approach to water issues and look forward to hearing from our witnesses today, all of whom are doing the hard work on the ground to develop needed water infrastructure by promoting partnerships rather than conflict. And we don't have a ranking member here today, uh, but I'm going to give the opportunity, uh, actually, do we have anyone else who wants to make a statement? 
Well, and, and thank you, Gardner. Chairman. Yeah. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Chairman McSally, for the opportunity to be here today. Thanks to all the witnesses. Uh, particularly welcome the two from Colorado, Mr. Marshall Brown, Ms. Melissa Belinda Kasson, Kasson. Thank you very much for uh, all of you being here today. And Mr. Wade Noble, every time you say Yuma County, I'm from Yuma County. I know. Uh, and but so it's, it, you know, Yuma County, Arizona County, is better. Colorado is a little bit, uh, <laughs> a little bit cooler in Yuma County. All right. <laughs> Wonderful. Thanks a lot. Uh, before turning to our witnesses, I ask unanimous consent to add a statement from Senator Feinstein in support of S-1932 to the record, along with letters of support from 18 national and statewide water groups and 58 water districts and municipalities for S-1932 and S-2044. These include Agribusiness and Water Council of Arizona, Irrigation and Electrical Districts Associations of Arizona, Salt River Project, Cities of Phoenix and Safford, uh, and Pima County. Without objection, they will be placed into the record. All right, let's now turn to our witnesses. We have five great witnesses today to discuss water infrastructure and the three bills before us today. First up is the Honorable Brenda Berman, Commissioner of Reclamation. And I might add that nearly everyone on the panel here has Arizona roots, just saying. Um, next, we will hear from Mr. Wade Noble, a water attorney from Yuma, a water sensei is what we like to call him, uh, who represents a number of irrigation districts that rely on Bureau of Reclamation facilities in the Welton Mohawk Irrigation District. He also serves in leadership and advisory positions with the Yuma County Agricultural Water Coalition, Agribusiness and Water Council of Arizona, National Water Resources Association, and the Family Farm Alliance. What do you do in your free time, Wade? I'm glad you could be here. Thanks for making the trip out from Arizona and for all the work you do for Yuma Irrigators and Water Resource in our state. After that, we'll hear from Mr. Marshall Brown, General Manager for Aurora Water in Colorado. He is also uh, representing the Water Reuse Association, and I would note he comes from Aurora by way of Scottsdale, so I know that we can trust him. <laughs> then we will hear from Ms. Melinda Casson, uh, Senior Counsel for the Theodore Roosevelt Conservation Partnership. And finally, Mr. Wesley Hipke, manager, or Managed Recharge Program Manager for the Idaho Department of Water Resources, another Arizona transplant, I may add, having spent nearly 20 years in Arizona's uh, Department of Water Resources. Uh, I really didn't plan this, uh, but it is great to have a lot of Arizona roots on the, uh, on the panel, uh, even though you're now using your skills to help some other states. Uh, anyway, Commissioner Berman, it's good to see you again. Uh, thanks for being here. You're recognized for five minutes. Thank you. Uh, Chairman McSally, uh, Senator Gardner, uh, members of the subcommittee who are here with us perhaps virtually, my name is Brenda Berman, Commissioner of the Bureau of Reclamation with the Department of the Interior. Thank you for providing me the opportunity to appear before you today. Uh, before I begin my remarks, I would first like to again thank you and thank this committee and your staff uh, for their leadership and excellent quick work on the Colorado River Drought Contingency Plan Authorization Act this past spring. It was really incredible work and it is moving forward. In fact, just last week, I was in San Diego for a signing ceremony where the International Boundary and Water Commission, both the Republic of Mexico section and the United States section signed a joint report. And this report describes how the United States and Mexico will protect Lake Mead elevations to benefit the Colorado River. This is really the last step in moving forward with our drought and scarcity plans for the Colorado River. It's a great accomplishment for cities, states, tribes, and all the others who depend on the Colorado River, and thank you. The committee has my written statement, so I'll use my time to highlight some of the underlying areas where we think the committee seeks to address in Senate Bill 1932, the Drought Resiliency and Water Supply Infrastructure Act, Senate Bill 2044, the Water Supply Infrastructure Rehabilitation and Utilization Act, Senate Bill 1570, the Aquifer Recharge Flexibility Act. As the co-sponsors of these bills are aware, as a nation, we need to invest in new and existing infrastructure. We need to invest in storage to increase water reliability, and we need to improve conveyance to secure our water supplies for future generations. Reclamations, dams, and reservoirs, our water conveyance systems, and power generation facilities are integral components of the nation's infrastructure and the economies of the Western states. This infrastructure is key to Reclamation's continued success. We operate just under 500 dams throughout 17 Western states. We impound 338 reservoirs with a total storage capacity of 140 million acre feet. We are the largest wholesaler of water in the United States. The water we deliver irrigates 10 million acres, so 20% of the farmers in the West, and provides drinking water to 31 million people. Reclamation is also the second largest hydropower producer in the United States. 
We've provided some handouts that I hope are in front of you to help explain the backdrop of where we work. Uh, you'll see in front of you, one is a map of 2019, the hydrologic condition in the West for 2019. And the other is exactly a year ago, so 2018. And if you look at the two, what a difference a year makes. So if you look at the Rio Grande, uh, last year's spring runoff was at 18%. This year, it's at 160%. Last year, the Colorado River Basin was in its fifth driest year on record that we know about. And this year, we're at 144% of average. I think we even had some snow in June. So uh, this is the backdrop we work in. Uh, we need, as water managers, to be able to deliver water, whether it's wet or whether it's dry. And there can be very large swings in the West. Uh, so just a thought to keep in mind of like, what is the infrastructure we need when it's a dry year like 2018 in some areas, or it's a wet year like it can be in 2019. And we'll see what we have in store for us in 2020. Uh, let me give an example on the Colorado River. Uh, despite a wet year, the Colorado River is in its 19th year of drought. And despite that, we have consistently delivered our treaty obligations to Mexico, and we have not yet had to declare a, a shortage in the lower basin. And what is the reason for that? Uh, first, as you saw uh, in the spring, a lot of co cooperation between the states, the water districts, and the two countries. A lot of water savings. But overwhelmingly, we have a robust storage system on the Colorado River. Federal surface storage on the Colorado River is about 60 million acre feet, meaning the federal reservoirs can store a combined total of four times the Colorado River's annual flow. If you compare that to somewhere like California, the Sacramento River, Northern California, has about the same runoff as the Colorado River, only their storage is barely up to a year's runoff. So that means in a time like 2017, which was the wettest year on record in California, uh, we had to let most of that water go out of the system. And in 2018, uh, which started off very dry in California and worked its way up to more towards an average year, uh, we weren't able to make deliveries. Uh, we had to take uh, several months where we had farmers who didn't know if they were going to get water or not, and municipalities who didn't know if they could depend on our supplies. Storage is absolutely essential. Infrastructure is absolutely essential to what we do and how we provide reliable water in the system. Uh, the investment that's made in the Colorado system, or the generations that went before us that invested in those systems, uh, that's what provided the efficiency, the flexibility, the conservation. That's what's increased our water supply reliability during this 19-year drought and for the future. Uh, across the West, we look at all of the above approach. Uh, we encourage diversity of resources. We have many programs that help with that. We view water reuse, water recycling, as well as groundwater recharge and desalinization as important parts of this water supply strategy. We'd like to work with the committee to keep working with you to strengthen these three bills that we're here to discuss today. And we'd like to discuss some other wind-related authorities to secure our water for future generations. So thank you for your time. Absolutely. I'm going to do something a little non-traditional since we started late. And um, uh, Mr. Noble, I'm going to wait to have you testify. I'm going to let Mr. Brown testify, and then I'm going to let you ask some questions. And then we're going to continue on with the panel, uh, just because he has a hard stop. All right? Flexibility is the key to air power, we used to say in the military. So, Mr. Brown. Good morning. Um, to start, I'd like to thank uh, Chairwoman Murkowski, Ranking Member Manchin and members of the subcommittee for inviting me here to, to speak about these issues today. Um, I appreciate the opportunity to represent the city of Aurora and also the Water Reuse Association who represent uh, over 250 utilities and over 300 uh, other businesses <clears throat> and institutions across the country that implement water recycling. Aurora Water uh, is a utility located east of Denver, Colorado. Uh, we provide drinking water, wastewater, and stormwater services to a population of over 370,000 people. Um, Aurora Water and the Water Reuse Association strongly support 
the Drought Resiliency and Water Supply Infrastructure Act, or Senate Bill 1932, and thank Senators Gardner, Feinstein, McSally, and Cinema for their leadership on this important uh, legislation. Senator Gardner has long been an advocate uh, on critical water issues, and we very much appreciate your leadership on such. Meeting, our, <clears throat> meeting the water needs of a growing community in the arid west is challenging. Uh, Aurora's water supply infrastructure is extensive and complicated. Aurora owns or partners in 12 reservoirs located throughout about a third of the state of Colorado. And we manage and maintain hundreds of miles of pipes have three drinking water treatment plants as well as a reclaimed water treatment facility. As most of the water supply is located west of the Continental Divide and most of the population is to the east, Aurora must transport and store water, um, including transporting it over mountain ranges up to 180 miles away uh, before it reaches our customers. This requires large and con a large and concerted effort to move water through tunnels, pipelines, and pumping facilities and requires that we build and maintain large reservoirs to effectively utilize that supply. Senate Bill 1932 creates valuable funding programs for utilities like Aurora Water to help address the enormous capital needs required to build and maintain the infrastructure necessary to sustain the growing populations that we have. In order to ensure our ability to provide water, we must create robust systems that integrate multiple increasingly complex components and technologies. For example, Aurora Water has storage capacity to meet three years of our annual average demand to help us, th help see us through uh, variable climate and endemic droughts. This storage is integrated into a system that also includes our ability to reuse 100, recapture and reuse essentially 100% of our wastewater return flows. And we use that for irrigation and to meet potal, potable demands. While we've invested over $700 million in processes including riverbank filtration, aquifer recharge and recovery, and industry-leading water treatment that includes advanced oxidation in order to create those reuse capabilities, we're not done. In order to manage increasingly variable source water conditions, we're planning to add over 150,000 acre feet of additional storage in our system. And since we operate in essentially a closed loop, we're seeing increasing levels of salinity. And we know that eventually, probably in the not too distant future, we're going to have to start removing the salts from that water in order to continue reusing it. Those types of needs and projects can benefit greatly from the legislation being considered here today. While the roles of government agencies may not be exactly the same today as they've been in the, in the past, uh, there remains a critical need for partnership at a local, state, and national level. Almost 36% of the, the lands in Colorado are federally owned, and systems like Aurora's, both our current or existing system and future, system are not possible with part, without partnership and support. So thank you again for allowing me the opportunity to, to visit with you today about how Senate Bill 1932 could be hugely beneficial to us and assist Aurora Water and other similar situated, similarly situated water providers in meeting these needs into the future. Uh, this bill goes a long way in providing realistic and sustainable funding mechanisms to help us develop or expand these complex multifaceted systems and solutions to address those ongoing water needs. Thank you again. Thank you, Mr. Brown. Uh, we're gonna go to Ms. Casson uh, next and then uh, we'll allow uh, Senator Gardner for some questions. We're going a little out of order here, Senator Risch, because we started a little bit late. 
That's so. unusual for this committee. Exactly. <laughs> Ms. Kasson. Thank you. I guess the first thing I should say, Chairman, is thank you for letting me be on this panel when I don't have a tie to Arizona. Um, <laughs> <laughs> absolutely. <laughs> Uh, the Theodore Roosevelt Conservation Partnership is an alliance of 60 hunter-angler, outdoor recreation, and science organizations dedicated to ensuring all Americans enjoy quality places to hunt and fish. TRCP appreciates this opportunity to testify about how to help the West build drought resilience in the face of decreasing water supplies and increasing demand. Well-focused federal policies and resources will allow us to meet a range of water needs. Congress can incentivize water conservation, water sharing, innovative technologies, and new strategies to help build a future with thriving cities and rural communities, diversified economies, sustainable agriculture, and healthy rivers and watersheds that provide recreation and ecological benefits to residents and visitors alike. Hunters and anglers need water in the landscape. Outdoor recreation infuses $887 billion into the U.S. economy and is especially important for rural America. Fish swim in clean, flowing rivers and streams. Migratory birds feed and rest on the wetlands along our flyways. Local bird populations nest in the riparian corridors. TRCP, its partners, and other NGOs recognize how many interests compete for the West's limited water supplies. Our experience shows that cooperation among diverse interests is the only path that leads to durable solutions. Recently, this committee helped pass the Colorado River DCP. I'll add my voice, an example of basin-wide cooperation. Thank you. Um, an amended version of S 1932, one of the bills you're considering today, would build on the success of DCP. I suggest several modifications for your consideration. First, um, the committee should ensure both compliance with state and federal laws and the support of the governor of the state for Section 3 storage projects at each step of, of, from feasibility to um, construction. This avoids having projects a state doesn't support move forward to receive federal funding, a scenario that may be more likely to lead to litigation than construction. Um, second, We'd ask the committee to expand the eligible product projects in Section 3 to projects that store and retain water in features of the landscape for later release. Just as restoring natural systems increases resiliency and can save money by diminishing the effects of coastal flooding, this approach can be a powerful tool for responding to drought. And a strategy to ensure water supplies for cities and agriculture also maintain flows and habitat for fish and wildlife. Like built water storage, infrastructure retains wet season precipitation and releases it during the dry season for use. It does so using the landscape. The quintessential Western infrastructure stores 75% of the West water is the mountain snowpack. Um, but there are other systems, mountain meadows, wetlands, floodplains, and riparian aquifers. Many groundwater projects in the West already use natural infrastructure. One, um, on, as part of the Platte River Recovery Implementation Program, is at the Tamarack State Wildlife Area in eastern Colorado, um, the other Yuma. During uh, spring runoff, partners pump water to, pon to ponds that, let the, that then let the water seep into the ground and move back to the river, arriving in late summer and fall to augment low flows. The project improves wildlife habitat, and contributes a measurable 10,000 acre feet of water for recovery of endangered cranes downstream in Nebraska. Another is the Cochise Conservation and Recharge Network um, along the San Pedro in Arizona, a desert river that supports native fish, 300 species of migratory birds, and hunters from the Clovis people to today's bow hunters. The Cochise partners use 6,000 acres of land along 25 miles of river to direct stormwater and effluent into catchment basins that allow the water to infiltrate, replenishing local groundwater for communities and base flows for fish and wildlife. Third, 1932 authorizes over a billion dollars for water projects, but one of the most effective and important strategies to combat drought and build a more resilient future isn't there, and that's water conservation and efficiency. Um, the bill includes no money for reducing water demand, nor for the kind of 
voluntary temporary compensated water demand management activities that will be critical um, in the Colorado River Basin to implement DCP and elsewhere in the West. Um, TRCP encourages the committee either by reauthorizing existing legislation like Water Smart or through bold new programs to add funding for conservation and efficiency to this package. Thank you for inviting me. TRCP looks forward to working with you and other Western water interests to make our water delivery system sustainable today and for a hotter, drier, and more crowded Western future. My written testimony includes other suggestions, um, and I'd be happy to answer questions. Thank you, Ms. Casson. Senator Gardner. Thank you, I hope I'm not setting a bad precedent for you on the committee by doing this, but thank you. I greatly appreciate it. And Father Fitzgibbons from Re Regis University in Denver really appreciates this, too, so I can uh, catch up with his group as well. So thank you. I would ask unanimous consent of, for a number of letters uh, to be entered into the record in support of uh, Senate Bill 1932 from the National Water Rights Association, the Colorado Water Congress, the Metropolitan Water District of Southern California, the Water Infrastructure Network, and others uh, just ask they be entered into the record. Without objection. Uh, thank you. And uh, Mr. Brown, it's obviously good to see you here today. And this is your first time testifying before Congress, so well done. Uh, I'm thankful that you're here today. Aurora has been an incredibly, has an incredibly diverse water supply system. The Boosted Tunnel is a part of that uh, system as well, I believe. Is that correct? Not our system. That's the Fry Arc system, not the not the Aurora system. So, uh, you know, if you ever get a chance to, as I have with, I think it was with with partners from Aurora, uh, standing in the Boosted Tunnel uh, in water that was this deep, the coldest water you can ever imagine. Mm -hmm. Incredible engineering feat. Uh, but I know you're here on on behalf of the Reuse Association. Let's focus on that. Um, in the West, permitting for water storage has been incredibly expensive. New water storage uh, can take years. You mentioned in your testimony uh, that you started planning in 2000 for a project you could hope to complete between 2050 and 2070. Uh, that increasing of, increase of capacity out west through new storage has become increasingly difficult. I think those numbers speak for themselves. So uh, how do we then refocus the importance on increasing supply through other means? Uh, because that increases in importance as well, as you did with Aurora uh, and some of the other projects like Prairie Water System. Can you walk through the extensive reuse system that you have and how that impacts us? Yeah, the, the water reuse system we have, um, obviously, uh, wastewater return flows are available year-round. So it, it, it's a critical supply that uh, doesn't exactly match up with our demands necessarily, and it's also got some um, challenges associated with treatment, but provides huge opportunities for a, a consistently available uh, steady supply also, though, requires that we dampen um, the demand associated with the supply so that we can meet the needs during peak demand periods such as the summer when the supply doesn't increase um, compared to, to lower demand periods in the winter when the supply is still there. So our system, actually, uh, multi-barrier approach, um, very high quality water, fairly expensive uh, source of supply. Um, and we've shared that supply with some of our partners to the south, but again, in order to use it effectively, um, we'll have to expand the system in the future to meet increasing wastewater return flows, and we'll also have to build storage in the system in order to store the water when it's available uh, as compared to the seasonal demands for the supply. So fantastic opportunity. It gives us the ability to recapture roughly all of our indoor wastewater uh, return flows. But again, in order to utilize those, we have to store some of those um, during the non-peak demand periods to use them during peak demands. Thank you, Mr. Brown. Uh, Commissioner Berman, obviously great to see you again. I haven't seen you, I don't think, since the signing of the historic DCP. Congratulations. That's a very important uh, accomplishment made necessary, as you pointed out, by a very historic drought. Uh, part of the agreements was studying a demand management program, uh, and uh, the basins are looking at that, but still vital for us to focus as well on the supply side. Uh, how important for us is it to take uh, into account in all of the above approach as we look at uh, water, not just storage, but conservation, desalination, uh, recharge to increase the water supply in the West? Uh, Senator, it's absolutely critical. Uh, communities need to be looking at all of their possible water supplies, and that is groundwater, that is conservation, reuse, desalinization, where that, that's the right thing to do. It, it's creating that redundancy. So if you know in the system, the, uh, surface water 
uh, might not be there if you have several years of drought in a row, uh, you can then turn back and rely on that groundwater or have built down your demand. Uh, so through water smart programs, through Title 16, through desalinization, sort of all the programs you're looking at here and others, uh, we absolutely believe in an all of, of the above strategy. Thank you. Ms. Kasson, thank you again for being here. Thanks for your work as well on trying to find a solution on a good Samaritan language, and hopefully we can have another hearing and opportunity on that within Congress. Uh, the, the project you identified in your testimony, the dealing with the Platte River, uh, talking about some of the, the natural opportunities to store water within systems, uh, could you talk a little bit more about how we could do a better job of that in the legislation? I, the the number one thing would be, and um, uh, committee staff actually circulated some language um, along with this draft bill with some potential ads with some carefully crafted definitions. But section three talks about surface water storage and groundwater storage. You could add um, a definition and add natural infrastructure water storage as well. It would not be, I don't think, complicated. And in fact, I, a lot of these projects, um, and Tamarick is, mm -hmm. is one example, there is a pump. So there is a, a piece of built infrastructure, but then the rest of the project is um, natural in that it uses the um, seepage river. and coming back to the river. So mm -hmm. a lot of the natural infrastructure projects which are measurable, are still taking advantage of pieces and, and using both some little pieces of built and um, a lot of the landscape to do the work. Thank you, Ms. Kasson, and thank you, uh, Chairman, for the accommodation. Thank you. Absolutely, and uh, next I'm gonna go to Senator Risch uh, for some questions, and he'll introduce uh, Mr. Hipke, and then Mr. Noble, you'll clean it up. Well, uh, thank you very much, uh, Madam Chairman. I, uh, I have a bill here that's uh, the Aquifer Recharge Flexibility Act, and for my friends, uh, uh, n none of them seem to be here, but my friends from the East Coast uh, don't really understand this. They don't understand how important water is to us, and uh, they don't understand that uh, uh, how, what, what a minimal amount of water we get. In eastern Idaho, we get uh, about 11 inches total snow and water, and uh, not much uh, better upstream where Mr. Hipke is from. But in any event... Um, the, uh, the, we, we do a lot of different things to use our water to, to be able to do what we do in Idaho, and that is to have a, a state that, even though we're owned two-thirds by the federal government, uh, we're able to do a lot of things uh, with uh, raising crops and uh, those kinds of things. But water is absolutely critical. And one of the things that, uh, that uh, is relatively recent, and I use the word relatively, is uh, recharge. Uh, it, it is incredibly important to us, uh, particularly in eastern Idaho, where we have the uh, Idaho's eastern snake plain aquifer, which is about the size of Lake Erie. Is that right, Mr. Hipke? Lake Erie is a pretty sizable body of water. And uh, so you think, well, gosh, if you got that much water, this shouldn't be a problem. Well, it is a problem because it is in the aquifer, and uh, we uh, have become very efficient at uh, drilling wells and taking water out of it in order to irrigate and do other things. So it's important that we monitor that aquifer and that uh, we recharge it uh, where possible. And that's what this uh, bill is designed to do. Mr. Mr. Hipke's in charge of the programs that, uh, that do the uh, recharge and uh, he's done an excellent job of it. But because as I said, two thirds of the land is owned by the federal government, and they get kind of cranky when you do things that you think need to be done, but they don't, particularly if they live back east, which a lot of them do. Uh, it's important that we have laws that, uh, that allow us to do this and allow us to do it more smoothly. Um, th this bill will, uh, uh, will allow uh, and make it more uh, smooth to cross BLM land uh, when a canal already holds an easement, recharge, uh, will take place on reclamation land and re reclamation facilities convey non-project water for recharge. These are all things that are really important to us and I think Mr. Hipke will be able to tell us how important these things actually are uh, for recharging uh, this uh, this aquifer. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce Mr. Hipke with your, with your permission, uh, Madam Chairman, and he can explain to us, uh, uh, if you would, how uh, this bill will provide greater flexibility in the use of our beloved federal lands to uh, get water to our aquifer. So, Mr. Hipke, the floor is yours. 
Chairman McStally and Senator Brish, um, I'm honored to testify today on behalf of the Idaho Water Resource Board on S-1570, the Aquifer Recharge Flexibility Act. As has been mentioned, I'm the recharge program manager for the state of Idaho, and also has been mentioned, I previously worked in the state of Arizona for many years on their, on their managed recharge program. I want to um, thank Senator Brish of my home state of Idaho for his tireless work on behalf of the board and other states in the West on this important uh, legislation. Idaho's largest and most productive aquifer is the ESPA, and it underlies uh, much of southern and eastern Idaho. This aquifer has been, has been declining since 1952. These declines have a direct impact on both the groundwater and surface water users of the area. About one million acres of irrigated agriculture, as well as the cities, towns, businesses, industries, and homes in the region rely on water pumped from this aquifer. In addition, the declining spring flows from the aquifer have an important um, have an impact on about 600,000 irrigated acres that, do, that divert water from the Snake River. These spring flows also provide water for the world's largest concentration of commercial fish hatcheries and feed surface water to the Mid-Snake and Hell's Canyon hydropower complexes, which provide Idaho with clean hydroelectric energy. Over much of the last two decades, southern Idaho water users have been embroiled in numerous court battles and at least four state Supreme Court appeals over this declining aquifer. In 2015, the state of Idaho and the water users throughout the region reached historic agreements to stabilize and rebuild this aquifer. As part of those agreements, groundwater users collectively agreed to reduce groundwater use by 240,000 acre feet annually. In addition, Idaho's legislature tasked the Idaho Water Resource Board with developing a program to recharge an average of 250,000 acre feet annually to the ESPA. On average, about 1.4 million acre feet any given year are available for the Snake River for aquifer recharge to the ESBA, most in the winter and during flood control operations in the spring. The managed aquifer efforts is a major undertaking for the state of Idaho. The state is committed to constructing the required infrastructure needed to accomplish these goals, having invested nearly 20 million on these improvements to date. Since 2017, Idaho has recharged over 1.2 million acre feet into the ESBA. Groundwater users have recharged an additional 400,000 acre feet during that time, all record setting accomplishments for the state of Idaho. But more must be done to restore this aquifer and other aquifers in the state. Based on studies conducted by the board, many optimal ESPA recharge sites either require the use of federally owned property to conduct the recharge activities, ex existing irrigation canals that cross federal lands where the easement specifies a purpose other than aquifer, aquifer recharge, or canal systems in federal ownership by the Bureau of Reclamation where congressional authorization did not include aquifer recharge. By utilizing existing water infrastructure, including those lands and canals under federal ownership to recharge our aquifers, we can optimize the use of these systems for multiple use of, um, uses and, and benefits while maintaining the cost of aquifer recharge to affordable levels. However, obtaining these necessary federal authorizations or permits has been one of our main challenges. S 1570, if enacted, would help provide greater flexibility to the board's effort to recharge the ESBA and other aquifers in Idaho. This bill would authorize reclamation and other federal agencies to allow the use of existing easements and the excess capacity in federally owned canals to deliver recharge water to the aquifers with a minimum of red tape all consistent with state water laws and policies. In conclusion, managing declining aquifers is a critical issue for most Western states. Idaho is at the forefront in developing large-scale managed aquifer recharge to actively manage their aquifers. The enactment of S-1570 will help Idaho and other Western states to use managed aquifer recharge as a key tool in dealing with this critical issue. 
Combined with the other water resource bills being considered here today, Idaho and the West will be provided additional strategic tools that would encourage partnerships and investment in new water storage, aquifer recharge, reuse, recycling, desalinization, and our aging water delivery infrastructure. Again, thank you very much for this opportunity to testify on behalf of the Idaho Water Resource Board um, in support of this important legislation. And I would stand for any questions you may have. Great, Thanks, thank you, thank appreciate you. it. Mr. Noble. Chairman McSally, Senator Risch, and the other unseen but appreciated members of the Water and Power Subcommittee, thank you for the opportunity to testify on the Water Supply Infrastructure Rehabilitation and Utilization Act, S-2044. This legislation is important to Western irrigated agriculture and our whole nation. And Senator McSally, if you'll permit me for just a deviation in my prepared remarks, we expressed to you our appreciation for the work that you have done. Personally, we had the opportunity to sit down and discuss this problem. You came to Yuma, you observed, you listened, you learned, you acted, you exercised leadership. We thank you for that. You. My name is Wade Noble. I am from Yuma, Arizona. Yuma is at the southern end of the Colorado River. Yuma County Agriculture provides the winter vegetables to 85% of the United States and Canada. Across the West, Bureau of Reclamation facilities are on average 50 years old, with some facilities 100 years old. In general, irrigation districts operate and maintain reclamation-owned facilities. These are transferred works. Reclamation retains ownership, but transfers routine operation and maintenance of the irrigation systems and the extraordinary maintenance and capital improvements of facilities and infrastructure to the district. In some instances, there is an additional layer. Reclamation contracts with one district as the responsible party for the routine operation, maintenance, and extraordinary maintenance and capital improvements of a shared transferred work. The other irrigation districts sharing the facility or system become funding parties. They are not directly responsible for completing routine and extraordinary maintenance and capital improvements, but they are financially responsible for the work. Imperial Dam is an example of a shared reclamation transferred work. The example shows the financial impacts to the funding party irrigation districts as a result of the extraordinary maintenance and capital improvements needed on aging infrastructure. Imperial Irrigation District, located in Imperial Cali County, California, and diverting almost 3 million acre feet of Colorado River water for agriculture and Imperial County cities and towns, is the responsible party for Imperial Dam. IID is contractually obligated to perform all routine and extraordinary maintenance at the dam. However, the Arizona and other California irrigation districts sharing Imperial Dam are obligated to pay their portion of the costs. In the next 10 years, the districts will spend over $50 million on extraordinary maintenance and capital improvements. Because the funding parties are not the responsible party, they have less funding or finance options. There is difficulty in obtaining grant monies or seeking traditional financing. Bonding is especially difficult for non-responsible parties and smaller districts. This leaves most districts with only two options, increasing assessments or, born, or burning through reserves. The aging infrastructure account addresses extraordinary maintenance challenges and creates a general fund for operating entities and project beneficiaries seeking funds. While my testimony is focused on Section 2 of S-2044, it is not meant to ignore the other two substantive sections. Section 3, Authorization of Appropriations for the Reclamation Safety of Dams Act, is important to address Western and national needs of water infrastructure. Appropriation of an additional $550 million for safety of dams will ensure reclamation can financially address dam infrastructure woes, no pun intended. Section four, review of flood control curves pilot project is important to Western and nationwide water managers. It will provide tools and flexibility to flood control and reservoir projects and allow managing entities to react to ever-changing climatic conditions. In Arizona, our friends and colleagues at the Salt River Project would benefit in the operation of Roosevelt Dam. 
If these pilot projects are successful, it will change how we manage systems and create programs resilient to climate variability. Considered as a whole, S-2044 will have significant positive impact on water infrastructure needs and water resource management. Again, we appreciate the opportunity to testify to the subcommittee. It has been a privilege and a pleasure. I am prepared to answer questions, but the easy ones, please. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Noble. Uh, we'll now turn to questions and I'll start it off. Uh, you just explained how the challenges that we have with examples like Imperial Dam and, and others uh, where those funding partners uh, don't have any other choice but to repay or in one year pay back for any investment in capital improvements. So you, you shared that in your written and your verbal testimony. Can you further explain why some of the other options that uh, others may have for debt financing don't work uh, or are too expensive for districts like uh, the Welton Mohawk or Humor Water Users Association in cases like this? Sure. Thank you, Senator. The traditional other options available include such things as private financing, borrowing, or bonding. Those are simply not available to smaller districts. If you use private financing, they want collateral. As the funding parties, they don't have access to the collateral, and therefore they can't pledge it. Private mm -hmm. financing is often much more expensive as the interest rate is usually higher. If we turn to bonding, that can be quite expensive. Just the cost of implementing a bond measure is very high. In addition, uh, there's the problem that that interest rate is higher and you have to commit reserves, which generally are not sufficient to cover the entire bond. So those two options, just not available. Great, thanks. So now speaking from your role at uh, NWRA and Family Farm Alliance, uh, how common is this challenge of access to capital for water managers around the West? Well, in response to being prepared for this particular item, uh, we chatted with several people involved throughout the West, and we find it's very common that there are many situations where they simply cannot privately fund or bond the things that need to be done. It's not that they don't or that they never have, it's just that it is widespread. Thank you. Commissioner Berman, Berman, do you have anything to add on that? No, I, I would say that this has been a long discussion in the water community about how to finance aid, you know, improvements to aging infrastructure. And, and so we, we tend to work with the committee, with you, and with our partners on mm -hmm. all the ideas that can work there. Great, thanks. Um, and as you know, Commissioner Berman, uh, our bill is intended to improve how the Bureau's extraordinary maintenance uh, authority is utilized. Do you know since enactment in 2009 how many times rec Reclamation has used its extended repayment authority for extraordinary maintenance projects at Transferred Works? I had my staff pull that up and we came up with 19 instances of where we've used that in the past. Okay, can you walk me through the current process for seeking funding and extended repayment for a project? Like what avenues do Congress or customers have to weigh in in that process? So we have a directive and standard, which is really our rules of how this works. Uh, but really it's about approaching your local office of reclamation, approaching your area office, uh, talking it through what is needed, uh, on the official side, uh, there needs to be a repayment contract that's signed. Uh, but I would say the, you know, that can be all be worked through. The most significant hurdle is usually appropriations, which it is for all the things we do. And uh, when you work with an area office about a project that's coming up, if it's going to happen under this authority, then uh, under the authority from 2009, uh, then it has to be through appropriations. So you are in the process and competing with all of the other projects out there that are subject to appropriations. Great, thanks. Um, uh, now I want to shift to safety of dams. It's my understanding uh, at some point there had been discussion as to whether some of the major repair items at the Imperial Dam qualified under safety of dams. Uh, are large diversion dams like Imperial eligible for safety of dams uh, if they meet other criteria? Uh, if they meet other criteria, all our dams, both large and small, are, uh, have the ability to be under the Safety of Dams program. Okay, great. Uh, part of the reason that we included this increase in Safety of Dams program is to ensure that there is enough cap room to accommodate any new projects uh, added to the inventory if needed. Uh, we don't need to hash this out now, but I just ask, are you willing to commit to working with me to take another look at whether Imperial Dam is one such project? Uh, we, we would uh, certainly work with you and work with the committee and with Mr. Noble and his clients uh, to move forward and look at Imperial Dam. Mm -hmm. Okay, great, thank you. 
Um, and now I want to talk about uh, supply uh, portfolio. Mr. Brown, uh, hearing your testimony, the diversity of water supply infrastructure you're pursuing is something that stuck out. Uh, one of the important things that S1932 does is take a similar broad approach that puts multiple water infrastructure options on the table. Can you talk a little bit about the importance of this diversified approach to infrastructure for your community and the strengths and weaknesses of the different components? Uh, yes, Senator, thank you. The Again, water supply in the arid west is uh, <clears throat> is fun and challenging. It, it, it's not a very common resource anymore. So the days of being able to find a, a supply that's fairly pristine and putting it through a treatment plant and then delivering it to customers, those days are pretty much gone. Um, all the supplies, uh, the quality of the supplies is, is compromised, whether you look for new sources of supply or whether you're looking at reuse projects. And so... Um, technologies are constantly evolving and giving us new opportunities to deal with the water quality challenges. And then again, the, the seasonal and the annual variabilities in the supply also present some significant challenges. The supplies are not always available at the same time the demands are there. So we, we have to build systems now that are extremely robust, that are multifaceted and take advantage of it a bunch of different technologies, uh, take advantage of different types of storage. There was a little bit of, of uh, testimony talking about the, the challenges and the, the opportunities with storage look a little different too. We can't go uh, build storage like we used to be able to, so we have to be more sensitive there. Underground storage is a great option, but underground storage by itself, at least in multiple settings, doesn't work without surface storage integrated with the underground storage to be able to get the water in and out of the systems. And so really we have to, to now as systems grow and expand um, and or progress to meet existing demands, we have to have multiple tools in the toolbox um, that afford us the opportunity to take advantage of emerging technologies, to take advantage of, of outside the box storage opportunities and uh, create systems that are robust. We can't afford to let any of our water uh, go wasted anymore or go unutilized when we have that water in our systems. So Great, thanks Mr. Brown. Senator Cantwell. Thank you Madam Chair and I thank the witnesses for being here. Ms. Casson, when you said uh, there's a lot of uh, hot, dry, and more crowded west, um, you couldn't have been talking more specifically about the Pacific Northwest because that is exactly the way we feel. The most recent uh, seasonal drought map uh, definitely put us in the bullseye as far as that brown area. And it's no secret that that then is an overlay to some of the challenges we face in fire season as well. So um, I'm very uh, concerned that we continue to adopt strategies. You outlined some like the smart water programs and things we were able to help integrate into the Yakima Basin program. And Mr. Uh, Hipke, is that the right pronunci pronunciation? Mr. Hipke, you talked about the uh, aquifer recharge. And so uh, in concept, I certainly support Senator Risch's bill. Why, at least for areas like the Pacific Northwest, shouldn't we be focusing more on recharge and integrations, holistic integration plans like we were been able to successfully do in, in Yakima? By that I mean if you're going to have warmer and drier conditions, less snowpack, but you're still going to have water, recharging those aquifers is like an easy layup. And then coordination on the conservation side and smart strategies, making best use of that also seem to just go hand in hand. Do you have any comments about the recharge? You didn't specifically call that out. Absolutely. Um, I've been doing managed recharge for oh, over 25 years now, and so I'm a big fan of that. And having said that, um, having worked extensively in two different states now and seeing the broad differences between them, I am an extreme fan of um, adaptive management. And what's been discussed here, um, we need a lot of tools in the toolbox. Um, because the situation is changing rapidly, it's not a one-size-fits-all. Like in Idaho, for the ESPA, um, recharge is a very good tool that we use, and that's not the only tool in that area. In, in other areas, recharge might not be an option, and then we need to look at storage. Because as you mentioned, there's a lot of demand, and the supply is much more 
uh, variable, and we need to be flexible uh, enough to take advantage of it when it's there. Ms. Casson, do you have ideas about what we could do to get better, um, mm, let's see, evangelizing of these cooperative programs? I, I almost still see us in kind of a divided universe here. There are those that in, definitely in the Pacific Northwest that believe in that uh, cooperation coordination, very innovation, very holistic. And then I see other parts of the country who are just continuing to fight over water. What can we do to be better evangelize and get people to adopt these approaches? I would, say, I would say a couple of things. First of all, I think the Colorado River Basin, we feel like we're doing cooperation too. So Good. there are Good. other, there Good. are some places outside Good. the Northwest. But one thing to think about in terms of um, increasing retention in the landscape and improving um, storage in non-traditional ways is there's a project that um, TRCP's partner, Trout Unlimited, worked on uh, in Montana on Nine Mile Creek, which was a drainage that had been adversely affected by legacy mining. And they were in there to do restoration. But healthy landscapes retain more water healthy riparian areas, intact systems, and they actually, after they spent 10 years doing the restoration, they got the University of Montana to come in and measure the amount of additional water flow that was coming from that restored landscape into the stream. I mean, it's measurable quantities of water that you can achieve, just like frequently in, um, in some kinds of water supply projects and, and water management, the environment gets to be like a, a secondary beneficiary. In this restoration project, water storage um, and supply was a secondary benefit of the restoration. So it goes both ways. And I think talking about the success stories is certainly one way um, to evangelize. Well, and I also think having robust federal support programs for it so that people are incented on smart water or on restoration and, you know, doing a better job on coordination. One of the reasons we fought so hard on the fire bill to get new fire funding fixes is because we were doing unbelievable stream restoration work and then we'd have a fire come through and knock it out. So the point was, why? so we have to get this coordinated and the challenges we face are becoming greater. Thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you to the witnesses. Thank you so much. Uh, we did have votes called uh, nearly 50 minutes ago, uh, so I'll be the last there. I wanna ask uh, another one more question uh, since you all made the trip out here. Uh, Mr. No Mr. Noble, again, as you know, the extraordinary maintenance account uh, created in S2044 only requires re reclamation to take requests for funding for projects that are transferred works and not those that are operated by reclamation. I know this isn't the case for Yuma, um, but in your experience, which is vast, are districts who are responsible for O&M at reserved works uh, facing similar challenges with repayment? Senator McSally, yes, they are. We have observed that throughout the West. There are challenges. The difference between reserved works and transferred works as far as funding is most often there is a sharing between the district and reclamation as to the cost of the repairs or work that's being done. But reclamation has the opportunity to appropriate for their share of the work. Great, thank you. Um, do, would it make sense for us to add, uh, to add that to our bill? Yes, it would. Reserved works? Yes. Okay, great. We might follow up on that with you. Uh, Commissioner Berman, how do you feel about that? The more flexibility we have, the easier it is to work. Great, thank you. Uh, I know we have a number of questions, I do as well, that we also still want to ask, and I know other members are probably then want to ask for the record. Uh, so I really would appreciate if you all were willing uh, to answer those questions as they're submitted for the record. Uh, I really appreciate everyone coming here today. Again, thanks for your uh, patience and uh, flexibility. Uh, but it was important to hear your testimonies on these pending bills as we move them forward to address this important issue uh, of our water infrastructure and water investments for the future. Uh, so these questions may be um, submitted for the record before the close of business on Friday. Uh, the record is gonna remain open for two weeks. We'd ask you to respond in writing and they will be made a part of the record. And again, thank you for coming today and the hearing is now adjourned.